What do I know of cultured ways, the guilt, the craft, and the lie? I, who was born in a naked land and bred in the open sky. The subtle tongue, the sophist guile, they fail when the broadswords sing. Rush in and die, dogs, I was a man before I was a king. The Road of Kings Chapter 5 Through the silence which shrouded the corridor of the royal palace stole twenty furtive figures. Their stealthy feet, bare or cased in soft leather, made no sound either on thick carpet or bare marble tile. The torches which stood in niches along the halls gleamed red on dagger, sword and keen-edged axe. Easy all, hissed Ascalanti. Stop that cursed loud breathing, whoever it is. The officer of the night guard has removed most of the sentries from these halls and made the rest drunk, but we must be careful, just the same. Ack, here come the guard. They crowded back behind a cluster of carven pillars, and almost immediately ten giants in black armor swung by at a measured pace. Their faces showed doubt as they glanced at the officer who was leading them away from their post of duty. This officer was rather pale, as the guard passed the hiding places of the conspirators, he was seen to wipe the sweat from his brow with a shaky hand. He was young, and this betrayal of a king did not come easy to him. He mentally cursed the vainglorious extravagance which had put him in debt to the money lenders and made him a pawn of scheming politicians. The guardmen clanked by and disappeared up the corridor. Good, grinned Ascalanti. Conan sleeps unguarded. Haste. If they catch us killing him, we're undone, but few men will espouse the cause of a dead king. I, haste, cried Rinaldo, his blue eyes matching the gleam of the sword he swung above his head. My blade is thirsty. I hear the gathering of the vultures. On. They hurried down the corridor with reckless speed and stopped before a gilded door which bore the royal dragon symbol of Aquilonia. Gromel, snapped Ascalanti. Break me this door open. The giant drew a deep breath and launched his mighty frame against the panels, which groaned and bent at the impact. Again he crouched and plunged. With a snapping of bolts and a rending crash of wood, the door splintered and burst inward. In, roared Ascalanti, on fire with the spirit of the deed. In, yelled Rinaldo. Death to the tyrant. They stopped short. Conan faced them, not a naked man roused mazed and unarmed out of deep sleep to be butchered like a sheep, but a barbarian wide awake and at bay, partly armored, and with his long sword in his hand. For an instant the tableau held, the four rebel noblemen in the broken door. And the horde of wild hairy faces crowding behind them, all held momentarily frozen by the sight of the blazing-eyed giant standing sword in hand in the middle of the candle-lighted chamber. In that instant Ascalanti beheld, on a small table near the royal couch, the silver scepter and the slender gold circlet which was the crown of Aquilonia, and the sight maddened him with desire. In, rogues, yelled the outlaw. He is one to twenty and he has no helmet. True, there had been lack of time to don the heavy plumed cask, or to lace in place the side plates of the cuirass, nor was there now time to snatch the great shield from the wall. Still, Conan was better protected than any of his foes except Valmana and Gromel, who were in full armor. The king glared, puzzled as to their identity. Ascalanti he did not know, he could not see through the closed visors of the armored conspirators, and Rinaldo had pulled his slouch cap down above his eyes. But there was no time for surmise. With a yell that rang to the roof, the killers flooded into the room, Gromel first. He came like a charging bull, head down, sword low for the disemboweling thrust. Conan sprang to meet him, and all his tigerish strength went into the arm that swung the sword. In a whistling arc the great blade flashed through the air and crashed on the Bassonian's helmet. Blade and cask shivered together and Gromel rolled lifeless on the floor.
Conan bounded back, still gripping the broken hilt. Gromel, he spat, his eyes blazing in amazement, as the shattered helmet disclosed the shattered head, then the rest of the pack were upon him. A dagger point raked along his ribs between breastplate and backplate, a sword edge flashed before his eyes. He flung aside the dagger wielder with his left arm, and smashed his broken hilt like a cestus into the swordsman's temple. The man's brains spattered in his face. Watch the door, five of you, screamed Ascalante, dancing about the edge of the singing steel whirlpool, for he feared that Conan might smash through their midst and escape. Rogues drew back momentarily, as their leader seized several and thrust them toward the single door. And in that brief respite Conan leaped to the wall and tore there from an ancient battle axe which, untouched by time, had hung there for half a century. With his back to the wall he faced the closing ring for a flashing instant, then leaped into the thick of them. He was no defensive fighter, even in the teeth of overwhelming odds he always carried the war to the enemy. Any other man would have already died there, and Conan himself did not hope to survive, but he did ferociously wish to inflict as much damage as he could before he fell. His barbaric soul was ablaze, and the chants of old heroes were singing in his ears. As he sprang from the wall his axe dropped an outlaw with a severed shoulder, and the terrible backhand return crushed the skull of another. Swords whined venomously about him, but death passed him by breathless margins. The Cimmerian moved in a blur of blinding speed. He was like a tiger among baboons as he leaped, sidestepped and spun, offering an ever-moving target, while his axe wove a shining wheel of death about him. For a brief space the assassins crowded him fiercely, raining blows blindly and hampered by their own numbers. Then they gave back suddenly, two corpses on the floor gave mute evidence of the king's fury, though Conan himself was bleeding from wounds on arm, neck and legs. Knaves, screamed Rinaldo, dashing off his feathered cap, his wild eyes glaring. Do you shrink from the combat? Shall the despot live? Out on it. He rushed in, hacking madly, but Conan, recognizing him, shattered his sword with a short terrific chop and with a powerful push of his open hand sent him reeling to the floor. The king took Ascalante's point in his left arm, and the outlaw barely saved his life by ducking and springing backward from the swinging axe. Again the wolves swirled in and Conan's axe sang and crushed. A hairy rascal stooped beneath its stroke and dived at the king's legs, but after wrestling for a brief instant at what seemed a solid iron tower, glanced up in time to see the axe falling. But not in time to avoid it. In the interim one of his comrades lifted a broadsword with both hands and hewed through the king's left shoulder plate, wounding the shoulder beneath. In an instant Conan's cuirass was full of blood. Valmana, flinging the attacker's right and left in his savage impatience, came plowing through and hacked murderously at Conan's unprotected head. The king ducked deeply and the sword shaved off a lock of his black hair as it whistled above him. Conan pivoted on his heel and struck in from the side. The axe crunched through the steel cuirass and Valmana crumpled with his whole left side caved in. Valmana, gasped Conan breathlessly, I'll know that dwarf in hell. He straightened to meet the maddened rush of Rinaldo, who charged in wild and wide open, armed only with a dagger. Conan leaped back, lifting his axe. Rinaldo, his voice was strident with desperate urgency. Back, I would not slay you. Die, tyrant, screamed the mad minstrel, hurling himself headlong on the king. Conan delayed the blow he was loath to deliver, until it was too late. Only when he felt the bite of the steel in his unprotected side did he strike, in a frenzy of blind desperation. Rinaldo dropped with his skull shattered, and Conan reeled back against the wall, blood spurting from between the fingers which gripped his wound. In, now, and slay him, yelled Ascalante. Conan put his back against the wall and lifted his axe. 
He stood like an image of the unconquerable primordial, legs braced far apart, head thrust forward, one hand clutching the wall for support, the other gripping the axe on high. With the great corded muscles standing out in iron ridges, and his features frozen in a death snarl of fury, his eyes blazing terribly through the mist of blood which veiled them. The men faltered, wild, criminal and dissolute though they were, yet they came of a breed men called civilized, with a civilized background, here was the barbarian, the natural killer. He shrank back, the dying tiger could still deal death. Conan sensed their uncertainty and grinned mirthlessly and ferociously. Who dies first, he mumbled through smashed and bloody lips. Ascalante leaped like a wolf, halted almost in midair with incredible quickness and fell prostrate to avoid the death which was hissing toward him. He frantically whirled his feet out of the way and rolled clear as Conan recovered from his missed blow and struck again. This time the axe sank inches deep into the polished floor close to Ascalante's revolving legs. Another misguided desperado chose this instant to charge, followed half-heartedly by his fellows. He intended killing Conan before the Cimmerian could wrench his axe from the floor, but his judgment was faulty. The red axe lurched up and crashed down and a crimson caricature of a man catapulted back against the legs of the attackers. At that instant a fearful scream burst from the rogues at the door as a black misshapen shadow fell across the wall. All but Ascalante wheeled at that cry, and then, howling like dogs, they burst blindly through the door in a raving, blaspheming mob, and scattered through the corridors in screaming flight. Ascalante did not look toward the door, he had eyes only for the wounded king. He supposed that the noise of the fray had at last roused the palace, and that the loyal guards were upon him. Though even in that moment it seemed strange that his hardened rogues should scream so terribly in their flight. Conan did not look toward the door because he was watching the outlaw with the burning eyes of a dying wolf. In this extremity Ascalante's cynical philosophy did not desert him. All seems to be lost, particularly honor, he murmured. However, the king is dying on his feet, and, whatever other cogitation might have passed through his mind is not to be known. For, leaving the sentence uncompleted, he ran lightly at Conan just as the Cimmerian was perforce employing his axe arm to wipe the blood from his blinded eyes. But even as he began his charge, there was a strange rushing in the air and a heavy weight struck terrifically between his shoulders. He was dashed headlong and great talons sank agonizingly in his flesh. Riding desperately beneath his attacker, he twisted his head about and stared into the face of nightmare and lunacy. Upon him crouched a great black thing which he knew was born in no sane or human world. Its slappering black fangs were near his throat and the glare of its yellow eyes shriveled his limbs as a killing wind shrivels young corn. The hideousness of its face transcended mere bestiality. It might have been the face of an ancient, evil mummy, quickened with demoniac life. In those abhorrent features the outlaw's dilated eyes seemed to see, like a shadow in the madness that enveloped him, a faint and terrible resemblance to the slave Thothamon. Then Ascalante's cynical and all-sufficient philosophy deserted him, and with a ghastly cry he gave up the ghost before those slavering fangs touched him. Conan, shaking the blood drops from his eyes, stared frozen. At first he thought it was a great black hound which stood above Ascalante's distorted body, then as his sight cleared he saw that it was neither a hound nor a baboon. With a cry that was like an echo of Ascalante's death shriek, he reeled away from the wall and met the leaping horror with a cast of his axe that had behind it all the desperate power of his electrified nerves. The flying weapon glanced singing from the slanting skull it should have crushed, and the king was hurled halfway across the chamber by the impact of the giant body. The slavering jaws closed on the arm Conan flung up to guard his throat, but the monster made no effort to secure a death grip. Over his mangled arm it glared fiendishly into the king's eyes, in which there began to be mirrored a likeness of the horror which stared from the dead eyes of Ascalante. 
Conan felt his soul shrivel and begin to be drawn out of his body. To drown in the yellow wells of cosmic horror which glimmered spectrally in the formless chaos that was growing about him and engulfing all life and sanity. Those eyes grew and became gigantic, and in them the Cimmerian glimpsed the reality of all the abysmal and blasphemous horrors that lurk in the outer darkness of formless voids and night gulfs. He opened his bloody lips to shriek his hate and loathing, but only a dry rattle burst from his throat. But the horror that paralyzed and destroyed Ascalante roused in the Cimmerian a frenzied fury akin to madness. The volcanic wrench of his whole body he plunged backward, heedless of the agony of his torn arm, dragging the monster bodily with him. And his outflung hand struck something his dazed fighting brain recognized as the hilt of his broken sword. Instinctively he gripped it and struck with all the power of nerve and thew, as a man stabs with a dagger. The broken blade sank deep and Conan's arm was released as the abhorrent mouth gaped as in agony. The king was hurled violently aside, and lifting himself on one hand he saw, as one mazed. The terrible convulsions of the monster from which thick blood was gushing through the great wound his broken blade had torn. And as he watched, its struggle ceased and it lay jerking spasmodically, staring upward with its grisly dead eyes. Conan blinked and shook the blood from his own eyes, it seemed to him that the thing was melting and disintegrating into a slimy unstable mass. Then a medley of voices reached his ears, and the room was thronged with the finally roused people of the court, knights, peers, ladies, men-at-arms. Counselors, all babbling and shouting and getting in one another's way. The black dragons were on hand, wild with rage, swearing and ruffling, with their hands on their hilts and foreign oaths in their teeth. Of the young officer of the door guard nothing was seen, nor was he found then or later, though earnestly sought after. Romel, Valmana, Rinaldo, exclaimed Publius, the high counselor, wringing his fat hands among the corpses. Black treachery. Someone shall dance for this. Call the guard. The guard is here, you old fool, cavalierly snapped Palantides, commander of the black dragons, forgetting Publius' rank in the stress of the moment. Best stop your caterwauling and aid us to bind the king's wounds. He's like to bleed to death. Yes, yes, cried Publius, who was a man of plans rather than action. We must bind his wounds. Send for every leech of the court. Oh, my lord, what a black shame on the city. Are you entirely slain? Wine, gasped the king from the couch where they had laid him. They put a goblet to his bloody lips and he drank like a man half dead of thirst. Good, he grunted, falling back. Slaying is cursed dry work. They had stanched the flow of blood, and the innate vitality of the barbarian was asserting itself. See first to the dagger wound in my side, he bade the court physicians. Ronaldo wrote me a deathly song there, and keen was the stylus. He should have hanged him long ago, gibbered Publius. No good can come of poets. Who is this? He nervously touched Ascalante's body with his sandal toe. Mitra, ejaculated the commander. It is Ascalante, once Count of Thun. What devil's work brought him up from his desert haunts? But why does he stare so, whispered Publius, drawing away, his own eyes wide and a peculiar prickling among the short hairs at the back of his fat neck. The others fell silent as they gazed at the dead outlaw. Had you seen what he and I saw? growled the king, sitting up despite the protests of the leeches. You had not wondered. Blast your own gaze by looking at, he stopped short, his mouth gaping, his finger pointing fruitlessly. Where the monster had died, only the bare floor met his eyes. Crom, he swore. The things melted back into the foulness which bore it. The king is delirious, whispered a noble. Conan and heard and swore with barbaric oaths. By Bad, Morrigan, Macha and Nemain, 
he concluded wrathfully. I am sane. It was like the cross between a Stygian mummy and a baboon. It came through the door, and Ascalante's rogues fled before it. It slew Ascalante, who was about to run me through. Then it came upon me and I slew it, how I know not, for my axe glanced from it as from a rock. But I think that the sage Epimetrius had a hand in it. Hark how he names Epimetrius, dead for fifteen hundred years, they whispered to each other. By Ymir, thundered the king. This night I talked with Epimetrius. He called to me in my dreams, and I walked down a black stone corridor carved with old gods, to a stone stair on the steps of which were the outlines of Set. Until I came to a crypt, and a tomb with a phoenix carved on it. In Mitra's name, Lord King, be silent. It was the high priest of Mitra who cried out, and his countenance was ashen. Conan threw up his head like a lion tossing back its mane, and his voice was thick with the growl of the angry lion. Am I a slave, to shut my mouth at your command? Nay, nay, my lord. The high priest was trembling, but not through fear of the royal wrath. I meant no offense. He bent his head close to the king and spoke in a whisper that carried only to Conan's ears. My lord, this is a matter beyond human understanding. Only the inner circle of the priestcraft know of the black stone corridor carved in the black heart of Mount Galamra, by unknown hands. Or of the phoenix-guarded tomb where Epimetrius was laid to rest fifteen hundred years ago. And since that time no living man has entered it, for his chosen priests, after placing the sage in the crypt, blocked up the outer entrance of the corridor so that no man could find it. And today not even the high priests know where it is. Only by word of mouth, handed down by the high priests to the chosen few, and jealously guarded. Does the inner circle of Mitra's acolytes know of the resting place of Epimetrius in the black heart of Galamra? It is one of the mysteries, on which Mitra's cult stands. I cannot say by what magic Epimetrius brought me to him, answered Conan. But I talked with him, and he made a mark on my sword. Why that mark made it deadly to demons, or what magic lay behind the mark, I know not, but though the blade broke on Grommel's helmet, yet the fragment was long enough to kill the horror. Let me see your sword, whispered the high priest from a throat gone suddenly dry. Conan held out the broken weapon and the high priest cried out and fell to his knees. Mitra guard us against the powers of darkness. Then some fell on their knees calling on Mitra, and some fled screaming from the chamber. There on the sword, it is the secret sign none might make but him, the emblem of the immortal phoenix which broods forever over his tomb. A candle, quick! Look again at the spot where the king said the goblin died. It lay in the shade of a broken screen. They threw the screen aside and bathed the floor in a flood of candlelight. And a shuddering silence fell over the people as they looked. Then some fell on their knees calling on Mitra, and some fled screaming from the chamber. There on the floor where the monster had died, there lay, like a tangible shadow, a broad dark stain that could not be washed out. The thing had left its outline clearly etched in its blood, and that outline was of no being of a sane and normal world. Grim and horrific it brooded there, like the shadow cast by one of the apish gods that squat on the shadowy altars of dim temples in the dark land of Stygia. The End This will conclude with this episode, The Phoenix on the Sword, by Robert E. Howard. Please help this project to continue providing more stories, by following, subscribe and sharing. Until the next story, thank you from Campfire and Fables.